Investing is full of jargon. In this video, I'll help you talk the talk by explaining 35 common terms used by investors. By the end of this video, you'll be able to translate Finance Bro into plain and simple English. Let's start with the term asset. There are many definitions, but to an investor, an asset is anything that has a monetary value. For example, a house or a car is an asset because it is worth a certain amount of money. Even money itself is an asset as cash has a monetary value. When we invest in something, it's just the fancy term for buying something. Usually, we buy an asset. A liability is the opposite and it's anything where a person or a business owes money to another person or business. For example, a bank loan is a liability because we owe money to a bank. To make a connection between assets and liabilities, we often need to sacrifice an asset, such as cash, to settle a liability, such as a loan. Next up is a stock. In some parts of the world, it's also called a share. Essentially, it's a small slice of a business or a proportional ownership. Imagine if Google were a pizza for a second. The pizza is divided into eight slices. If I own one slice of the pizza, I own 12.5% of the pizza, in this case, the Apple company. This is all stocks and shares are, is a part ownership of something. As an investor, this could be part ownership of a company, a piece of art, a piece of gold, or even a piece of a racehorse. The monetary value of a stock asset is often called the stock price or share price. This is the value investors perceive the slice of company to be worth. This is a function of how profitable the company is. What its growth prospects are, its intellectual property assets, there are thousands of factors at play here. If you take the stock price and multiply it by the total number of stocks or shares in existence, we get the market capitalization. Using the pizza example, if the pizza has a value of $8 and it has eight slices, each slice is worth $1 a piece. If the pizza doubles in value to $16 from eight, each slice is now worth $2 and so forth. Those that invest in company stock are called shareholders or stockholders simply because they hold the stock of the company. Following stock, we also have the stock market. This is where a company organizes buyers and sellers of stocks to come together and trade. In the United States, they have the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Here in Australia and New Zealand, we have the NZX and the ASX. For investors to interact with the stock market, we need to go through a stock broker. These are the privileged people and companies that have access to the stock market to buy and sell on our behalf. In New Zealand, we have a few brokers such as Sharesies and Hatch. In Australia, there's Moomoo, Perla and Comsec. There are many brokers out there and every year there are new ones entering the market. Then we have bonds. A bond is a fancy name for a loan or an IOU. As investors, we can buy bonds from banks companies, and even governments. Essentially, we become the bank providing financing to these other parties. Next, we have a term called index. Simply put, an index is a tool for measuring the performance of a group of assets. Usually, it stocks. In the United States, one of their largest indexes is the S&P 500. A company named Standard & Poor's took the 500 largest companies in the United States and created an index by putting them all together under the S&P 500 banner. When the S&P 500 goes up 1%, what the news is really saying in its simplest form is that the stock prices of America's 500 largest companies increased on average by 1% for the day. Now we can't invest in an index but what some companies have created is an index fund. This allows us to indirectly invest in an index, with the company managing the fund trying their best to accurately emulate an index's performance. A large part of this is called weighting. This defines the percentage of a fund or an index that is in each asset. The weightings affect the returns of the fund and the index. The closer the performance of both the fund and the index, which depends on the weightings, is called the tracking error. The lower the difference, the less tracking error we have. It basically measures how closely the fund tracks an underlying index. Every so often, an index fund will perform what's called a rebalance. This is where they buy and sell all of the assets in the fund to realign its proportionality with the index. As a simple example, let's say an index is 50% invested in Amazon and 50% in Tesla company stock. After a month, Amazon saw its stock price increase while Tesla saw the opposite. An index fund tracking the index would then have more than 50% of its value in Amazon stock 
and less than 50% in Tesla stock. To rebalance back to the index of 50-50, the fund would need to sell Amazon stock and buy Tesla stock. Index funds can be listed or unlisted. When we talk about listing, what we really mean is whether we can buy and sell units in the fund on the stock market or not. A listed company or fund is something we can buy through a broker on the stock market. Tesla is a listed company because it is on the Nasdaq stock exchange. Foodstuffs on the other hand, is one of our large supermarkets here in New Zealand and it's unlisted because we cannot buy shares in them on the stock market. A listed fund is generally called an exchange traded fund or ETF for short. There are many ETFs on the market trying to emulate the diverse universe of indexes that exist. It can be as niche as investing in only pet care companies to the Vanguard S&P 500 fund that invests in America's 500 largest companies. Investors generally choose an ETF based on its theme and not a specific company. Now they could invest in stocks individually, but often it's cheaper to buy the ETF itself. Diversification is an important investing term. It is like the old saying, don't have all your eggs in one basket. In investing, it means don't buy a single stock in a single industry in a single country. Index funds are a common approach to diversification, but investing in individual companies can work as well. When we invest in company stocks, often the underlying companies make a profit. Sometimes the profit they make exceeds the amount they need to reinvest to keep the business going. A dividend represents this distribution, and many investors buy stocks that specifically offer high dividends. To compare dividends, we often use what's called the dividend yield. This is a measure of the dividends paid over the past year, divided by the price of the stock. If I invest a dollar, how much did the company pay to shareholders over the past year as a dividend, proportional to the dollar? What it basically means is that if I put a dollar in today, over the past year, that dollar would have earned around 5 cents as a return. Now stock prices tend to go up and down a lot, often for no underlying reason. To measure the degree of swings, investors use the term volatility. It can be used for stocks or market indexes alike. Some investors prefer low volatility, while others enjoy high volatility. Day traders are those that actively buy and sell stocks whereas buy and hold investors prefer to buy and much more rarely sell. Day traders love volatility as they can quickly buy and sell stocks to quickly realize a profit within a matter of seconds in some cases. When an investor purchases an investment asset, we say they are taking a long position. When an investor sells it, either using their own or borrowed assets, we say they are taking a short position. Buying is long, selling is short. Investors with a long position are hoping the underlying asset increases in value Value. Short investors, on the other hand, hope the value of the asset declines. If you've seen the movie The Big Short, you'll remember Michael Burry took a short position against the housing market by selling borrowed mortgage-backed securities. He hoped that the value of housing would fall, therefore causing the mortgage-backed securities to decline in value. This was during the 2008 recession. Broadly speaking, a recession is when there is less economic activity in an economy. If there is less economic activity, people are spending less money and businesses are therefore making less money. Investors don't like this and share prices tend to fall as a result. This is what we call a bear market. A bull market is the opposite. When things are looking good, people are spending more and company profits are increasing. This is when we expect stock prices to be increasing. During the bear market, investors that sell at lower prices than they bought at are taking a capital loss. This is when company stock is sold for a lower price than it was bought at. In the United States, sometimes this can be a good way to reduce taxes through what's called tax loss harvesting. In New Zealand, unfortunately, we cannot do the same. During a bull market, selling stocks for a higher price than what they are bought at is called a capital gain. We know this term too well, as many housing market investors have made massive capital gains profits. The volume of buying and selling activity for a specific asset is called liquidity. This represents our ability to convert an asset into cash quickly. If an asset is highly liquid, selling is a piece of cake and can be done within the day. Cash is a simple example as we simply have to go to an ATM. Low liquidity is something that can take months to sell, such as a piece of art, a house, or a company stock that doesn't have many buyers on the stock market. A higher liquidity is nearly always preferred by investors. There is a few different types of stocks in the market. Blue chip stocks, often just referred to as blue chips, are those of large well-known companies with a history of steady growth and financial stability. Think of Coca-Cola. They can be found nearly everywhere across the world. 
and have existed for well over 100 years. Their stock price has had stable growth too. They are an obvious blue chip stock. Alongside them, we have a value stock. This is when the stock price of a company is lower than what is perceived to be their true value. In essence, it's a stock that is seen to be cheap and many investors such as Warren Buffett have made billions from their approach to finding such value stocks. The true value or intrinsic value is a subjective term for every investor as to what the company's stock price should be based on its profits, its assets, or even its dividends. Another common term is growth stocks. These are stocks that investors believe will grow faster than the market average. In 2023, the S&P 500 grew by 24%. Meta, Facebook's parent company, rose by a whopping 194% clearly standing as a growth stock. Company stock can carry any of these terms, or even a bit of all three at once. At the start of 2023, Meta was both a blue chip and a value stock, as it was well known and it was trading below its intrinsic value. Once investors clued on, they started buying it, causing the stock price to increase, becoming a growth stock. In investing terms, we call this momentum when the price of an asset continues to increase uninhibited. There you have it. 35 must-know investing terms to start speaking the Wall Street lingo. There are literally thousands of terms I could have used in this video, so if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to let me know down below in the comments. A whopping 90% of my audience is yet to subscribe to the channel. Subscribing to my channel encourages me to make more content just like this, so please make sure to show your support by subscribing down below. Thanks for watching, and as always, I look forward to catching you on the next one. Cheers.